Thank you all for joining us today for this webinar on a new empirical model which can be used to calculate sound transmission parameters for wood frame assemblies. As Suzanne just mentioned, I'm Jason Smart, Manager of Engineering Technology at the American Wood Council. And as noted on this slide, uh, AWC is a registered provider with the AIA Continuing Education System and, uh, and ICC. And uh, any credits earned after completion of this course will be reported for AIA members. Certificates of completion are available both for AIA members and non-AIA members alike. Also, participants can access and download this presentation on the AWC website at the address shown on the left side of, this, of the screen here. The course description is provided on this slide. And uh, I presume you've already read it, so I'm not going to delve into it or reread it for you right now. So now let's find out about our audience makeup before we really get into this. Uh, Suzanne? Okay. You know the drill here. What is your profession? Architect, engineer, code official, fire service, or other? And I'm going to go ahead and close it. And it looks like we've got the majority of engineers, 63%, followed closely by code officials and architects. Welcome, Great. everyone. OK, yes, welcome to everyone. Thanks. Um, there are four primary learning objectives to this course. First, uh, we're going to learn some of the basics of sound transmission physics in buildings and how this is perceived by building occupants. Second, to understand code provisions relating to sound transmission and how you can demonstrate compliance with these provisions. Third, we'll be able to describe the scope of the AWC empirical model for sound transmission. This will include how the model was developed, how it works, and how it was validated. And then lastly, we'll evaluate ways in which the model can be used to demonstrate compliance with the code through estimation of sound transmission parameters. Also, as part of this objective, we'll talk about the scope and limitations of the model. Just to give an overview of the outline for this brief course, I'm going to get us started off by reviewing the, uh, the basics. I'm not going to really get into the physics that much of, uh, of the acoustics, but um, I'll talk about the terminology, which you should become familiar with if you're not already. Um, and I'll explain, I'll try to explain. I know there's a lot of uh, probably new terms for those who haven't dealt with um, acoustics or even sound transmission, but I'll try to explain those as I go. Next, we'll review the code provisions relating to sound transmission within the model building code, specifically the IBC or International Building Code. Third, we'll take a look at the sound transmission data that was used for the model development and validation. As part of this, we'll see how AWC analyzed the data in order to develop sound transmission model. Fourth, I'll describe how AWC, how the AWC sound transmission model works and what types of assemblies it applies to. Fifth, we'll take a look at how the model was validated and investigate the typical accuracies observed from it. And then lastly, if I have some time, I'll go through a couple of examples on how the model can be applied for specific assemblies. So let's start out with a brief review of the basics here. Sounds that are generated in one part of a building can be transmitted to another part of the same building in several different ways. Let's look specifically at the case of rooms or apartments that are separated by a building assembly, such as a wall or floor ceiling assembly. There are two general means by which sound waves can be transferred from one room to another. I'm sorry if you hear the background noise from the, uh, the uh, ambulance going by also. It's a prime example of uh, sound transmission. Um, the, uh, the first is sound transmission directly through the assembly. This is represented by the blue arrows in this diagram. It passes from the source room where the sound originates directly through the assembly to the adjacent room. The second is sound waves flanking around the assembly. This is represented by the orange arrows in this diagram. And flanking may involve airborne sound passing through air gaps that are at the intersections of the assemblies. It also may involve structure-borne sound passing through adjacent assemblies, which offer less resistance to the sound waves. 
or often, more often than not, uh, flanking results from the combination of both of these. <clears throat> Generally speaking, sound waves are transmitted most readily through the path which offers the least resistance or impedance. So let's consider an assembly that is carefully, just a hypothetical assembly that's carefully designed to minimize the sound transmission, or in other words, maximize transmission loss for maximum privacy between dwelling areas. If there's an alternative path available, which affords less resistance going around the assembly, the sound will be transmitted through that path instead. This flanking would effectively negate the special attention that was given to the design of that assembly. So obviously, because of that, flanking is very important and it needs to be addressed in building acoustics. It's typically addressed through other means though, besides uh, assembly design. Examples of these other means include proper detailing and sealing at intersections between assemblies. Our discussion today focuses on sound transmission through an assembly as it is addressed within the building codes. Unlike flanking, sound transmission through an assembly can, can be addressed in the design of the assembly itself. Sound transmission through an assembly can come from either an airborne sound source or a structure-borne sound source. Let's look at airborne sound sources first. Uh, examples of these include elect amplified, amplified electronic devices such as TVs or radios, human voices, pets, musical instruments, and so on. Airborne sound transmission can be laboratory tested in accordance with ASTM E90. The measured parameter in this test is transmission loss. So wherever you see the acronym TL, or you hear me say TL throughout this presentation, I'm referring to transmission loss. That's what that's what uh, how I abbreviate it here. When the when the tested uh, when tested per ASTM E90, a TL measurement is taken at the midpoint of each one third octave frequency band. There are 16 of these bands in all. They're separated by one third octave each. Often a single number rating is desired in order to represent the relative overall sound insulation performance of the assembly across a wide range of frequencies. The sound transmission class or STC is used for, the, for this purpose. So again, that STC is, it stands for sound transmission class. The STC is calculated in accordance with ASTM E413, classification for rating sound insulation. <clears throat> Now let's look at structure-borne sound sources. Examples of structure-borne sound sources include footfall noise, uh, impacts from objects that are dropped on the floor of the level above, and other such impacts. Structure-borne sound transmission can be laboratory tested in accordance with ASTM E492. The measured parameter in this test is normalized impact sound pressure level. I'm going to refer to this as ISPL just for short. So that's normalized impact sound pressure level, ISPL. When tested per ASTM E492, an ISPL measurement is, is also taken at the midpoint of each one-third octave frequency band. And then a, number, a single number rating can be derived in a similar manner to what's done for STC uh, to represent the relative overall impact sound insulation uh, performance of the assembly. This single number rating for, for structure-borne sound transmission is called the impact insulation class, or IIC. It is calculated in accordance with ASTM E989. Just like STC, the impact insulation class represents sound insulation performance across a wide range of frequencies. However, the applicable frequency range starts and ends slightly lower uh, than the frequency range used for airborne sound transmission. Before we move on to the next section of this course, I wanted to touch briefly upon something called the mass law or mass frequency law of acoustics. According to the mass law, the transmission loss of a sound transmitted through a solid panel increases six decibels for every doubling of the panel mass. It also increases every, six decibels for every doubling of the frequency of the sound that's being transmitted. The formula is shown on this graph here, and as you can see, Transmission loss follows a straight, positively sloped line when plotted with respect to the log of the product of frequency and mass. This is important to today's discussion because 
the transmission loss performance of certain layers within a wood frame floor ceiling assembly can fit the mass law fairly well, at least that is for uh, within the low to mid range of frequencies. I'll demonstrate this graphically in just a few minutes. Now let's talk about the provisions within the model building code which pertain to sound transmission. The IBC has provisions addressing both airborne, and airborne sound transmission and structure-borne sound transmission. These are found in section 1206 of the 2018 IBC. The provisions apply to assemblies such as walls and floor ceiling assemblies, specifically to those that either separate a, a dwelling or sleeping areas from one another, or uh, assemblies that separate dwelling or sleeping areas from a public area. Examples of such public areas are given in section 1206.1, and they include halls, corridors, stairways, and service areas. <clears throat> Airborne sound transmission is addressed in section 1206.2 of the 2018 IVC. These provisions apply both to walls and floor ceiling assemblies. They require a minimum STC rating of 50, based on laboratory testing in accordance with ASTM E90, or alternatively, a minimum uh, of 45, a minimum rating of 45 can be used if field tested. Also, as an alternative, uh, Section 1206.2 allows for the minimum rating of 50 to be established through engineering analysis. Such an engineering analysis must be based on ASTM E90 test data of other similar assemblies. This alternative provision is analogous to one of the means by which fire resistance ratings are permitted to be established in accordance with IBC section 703.3 parent 4. So if there are any of you on, on the call now who are uh, fire safety engineers, you, um, you should recognize that section 703.3 parent 4. It's analogous to this engineering um, analysis alternative. And then uh, Let's look at uh, specifically at structure-borne sound transmission. As it's addressed within the IBC, it is specifically addressed in 12, section 1206.3 of the 2018 IBC. Unlike airborne sound transmission, provisions of the 12 of uh, 1206.2, uh, I'm sorry, 1206.2 is where airborne sound transmission is um, is addressed. But unlike those provisions, uh, these provisions apply only to floor ceiling assemblies. So impact ratings are only necessary for the floor ceiling assembly, not the wall assembly. But again, a minimum rating of 50 is required. As mentioned in the previous section of this presentation, this is based on laboratory testing in accordance with ASTM E492. If field tested, a minimum rating of 45 is required, just like for airborne sound transmission. Section 1206.3 also explicitly allows for an alternative wherein the minimum rating of 50 may be established through engineering analysis. And again, such an engineering analysis must be based on laboratory test data of other similar assemblies. Here's a table which gives a brief summary of the applicable test standards and code provisions we've discussed so far. This is just a recap before we start looking at the, at the test data and analysis that was used. But also before we start looking at the test data, uh, Suzanne is gonna quiz us with a quick polling question. I sure am. What way or ways can the code required minimum STC and IIC ratings be demonstrated for an assembly? A, ongoing full-scale structural monitoring. B, direct laboratory testing per ASTM E90 and E492. C, engineering analysis based on comparison to other E90 tests. Or D, either B and C. So I'm gonna wait until about 80% of the people vote. We're almost there. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. And the majority of people say either B or C. Jason? I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes, that is correct. Uh, uh, D is correct. It's either B or C, either direct laboratory testing per ASTM E90 and E492, or the engineering analysis is based on uh, comparison of other uh, E90 and E492 tests. 
Okay, so moving on to the data and analysis that was used in developing the AWC sound transmission model. In compiling the modeling database, AWC initially gathered more than 300 publicly available STC and IIC data points from 17 different sources. However, the database was subsequently trimmed to include only assemblies which, with uh, certain components and component combinations. These include framing consisting of either saw and lumber, prefabricated wood eye joists, or metal plate connected wood trusses, RC1 type resilient channels at spacings of either 16 or 24 inches on center, a ceiling layer comprised of either one or two layers of gypsum wallboard having a thickness of either one half inch or five eighths inches. Naturally, the scope of the resulting empirical model, which was developed from this database, is limited to assemblies having these components and component combinations. The, reason for, the reasons for imposing these scope limitations are described in detail within the new AWC Technical Report 15, TR15. And TR15 is available on, is now available for download on the AWC website at awc.org. <clears throat> Also, while compiling the modeling database, it was noted that there are significant differences between the test results from different test laboratories. This has been well known for some time now by uh, those who, who are familiar with these standards and who, uh, who have used them in laboratories, um, that uh, even for the case of assemblies that are nominally identical, tested, you know, one tested at, a, at laboratory A and another tested at laboratory B, you get different results even for the same uh, assembly configuration. This makes it nearly impossible to determine the influence of component variations through a, through a comparison of the test data from different laboratories. To avoid this confounding factor within the database, AWC opted to use data from a single laboratory source. And the majority of usable data on assemblies within the scope of the model the AWC chosen scope of the model came from the National Research Council of Canada. So NRC was selected as the most appropriate data source for this study. The publicly available NRC data came from two separate reports, each pertaining to its own phase of a two-phase project. The phase one report was dated July 2000. That's, uh, you see the cover of that report here on this slide. And the phase two report was dated January 2005. While the publicly available NRC data was robust for untopped assemblies without floor coverings, additional data was necessary. Specifically, additional data was necessary in order to fill gaps on assembly configurations for which the available data was a little sparse. In order to fill these gaps, AWC performed additional ASTM E90 and E492 testing at NRC. The test matrix consisted of 31 unique assemblies which were not already included within the publicly available NRC data. These additional tested assemblies included numerous assemblies with uh, gypsum concrete topping, assembly configurations with eye joists at 24 inches on center and resilient channels at 16 inches on center, which were also not well represented in the original database, assemblies with common generic floor coverings and a few other configurations which were tested to improve the database. <clears throat> So with the addition of the new data from the extra AWC tests, the modeling database included 48 complete bare floor assemblies. And by bare floor assemblies, I'm referring to assemblies without a floor covering, 14 assemblies having various common generic floor coverings, and 16 partial assemblies. By the term partial assembly, I'm referring to a test assembly consisting of only the framing and either the floor layer or the ceiling layer. So really it's just uh, you're testing one layer there in those partial assemblies. In a few minutes, we'll discuss how these partial assemblies were used within the model. Then there was also a validation database, which consisted of a completely separate set of test data from that used in the modeling database. This set of data, which was used in order to verify the validity of the model, consisted of 35 complete bare floor assemblies and four assemblies having floor coverings. Summing these up, you can see that uh, there is test data from a total of 117 different assemblies in all. 
This table, which is from TR15, summarizes the material types, weight ranges, and thickness ranges of the components comprising the tested assemblies. It represents assemblies included within both the modeling database and the validation database. Since the model is empirical, these ranges give a general sense of the boundaries of the model scope. Separate components within a given assembly will often interact with one another, so component combinations are an important consideration. The component combinations represented within the modeling database for assemblies without a topping are shown here in this table by gray shaded cells. And then the green shaded cells indicate component combinations represented within the validation database. The green cells show how data used to validate the model included many component combinations which are not included within the modeling database. This allowed for a more robust validation it gives an indication of how the model performs for assemblies in which multiple, multiple components vary from those of the baseline assemblies. And then this table shows the component combinations represented within the database for assemblies having a cast in place topping, specifically a one inch gypsum concrete topping. Of course, the shaded cells in this table are more sparse than in the table I showed you just a minute ago for untopped assemblies. That's only because this table focuses on that, that particular subset of the database, assemblies with the one inch gypsum concrete topping. <clears throat> the blue curve on this graph shows what a typical transmission loss contour looks like for a light frame assembly without a topping. This one happens to be from the NRC reference assembly, which had the following components. It had a floor layer that was 19 30 seconds inch OSB, I'm sorry, that was not the floor covering, but the subfloor layer. Um, within the cavity, there is one layer of six inch fiberglass insulation bat between the joists. The framing consisted of two by 10 joists at 16 inches on center. RC1 resilient channels were attached to the bottom flanges of the joists and they ran, at, uh, they ran perpendicular to the joists at 24 inches on center. And then the ceiling layer consisted of one layer of five eighths inch uh, gypsum wallboard. The red curve on this graph represents the ASTM E413 reference contour, which is fitted to the TL contour in order to determine the sound transmission class. The STC for this particular assembly is 52. I'll explain in greater detail a little later how the STC is determined by fitting the reference contour to the measured TL contour. The same procedure is also used in the TR15 model. And here's what a typical ISPL impact sound pressure level contour looks like for an assembly without a topping or floor covering. Like the graph on the previous slide, this data was measured from the NRC reference assembly. The red curve on this graph represents again the reference contour, but from a different standard, it's from ASTM E989. And notice that this contour has a downward slope rather than an upward slope for impact sound transmission. The IIC for this particular assembly was 46, but of course it corresponds to an assembly that did not have a floor covering, so it is not directly applicable to an actual finished floor ceiling assembly with a floor covering. Uh, just as an example, this same base assembly with a typical floor covering could easily achieve an IIC rating of well over 50, if it had, especially if it had a resilient floor covering. I mentioned earlier that the modeling database included a set of partial assemblies consisting solely of framing and either a ceiling layer or a floor layer. These, these graphs show uh, measured transmission losses for partial assemblies. The one on the left is for a partial assembly consisting of a floor layer only, and then the one on the right is for a partial assist, uh, assembly consisting of a ceiling layer only. Note the sloped light green line in each graph. This represents the mass law prediction for each partial assembly. The transmission loss of the ceiling layer fits the mass law much better than that of the floor layer. This is due largely to the isolation that's provided by the resilient channels between the framing and the ceiling layer. Of course, at higher frequencies, the ceiling layer uh, TL does, you can see how it deviates from the mass law prediction. This is just because of a, a phenomena called coincidence, and uh, we don't really need to get into that here in this discussion.
but that's another acoustical phenomenon. We can sum the measured transmission losses from each of those respective layers, the floor layer and the ceiling layer, at each frequency. When this is done, the resulting curve is similar to the measured transmission loss of the assembly as a whole. The graph on the left shows both of these curves. The sum of layer, the sum of layer TL values is in light green, and the measured TL values of the whole assembly is the dark green curve. The difference between the sum of layer TL contours and the measured TL contour from the complete assembly is shown in the graph on the right. For, for simplicity, we'll just refer to this, the graph on the right, that curve, as the system effect, okay, in this, in this discussion, and also in TR15 is referred to as a system effect. This system effect is influenced by certain component variables such as insulation type and thickness. But the differences between system effects of various assemblies are generally less than the differences between the TL values of those same assemblies. In other words, the system effect is generally less sensitive to component variations than the transmission losses are. This turns out to be a very useful fact or phenomenon when it comes to this to modeling, and it's used in this model, in the TR15 model. Let's look at a few examples of variations and system effects resulting from variations of components within the assembly. I've included this slide and the next two after it for this purpose. The graph on this slide shows how the system effect varies with respect to variations in insulation type and thickness. The system effect accounts for the full effect of the insulation. This is because the effect of the insulation within the cavity is not reflected in either of the layer transmission loss values. So insulation, which provides sound absorption within the cavity, is the single biggest contributor to the system effect. And it should come as no surprise that the, uh, the one line which deviates from the rest of these lines, the red one there, uh, represents an assembly that does not have any insulation at all. As you can see, the system effect values for this assembly are negative across the entire frequency spectrum. In other words, for the assembly without insulation, the sum of layer TL values is higher than the TL of the whole assembly at every frequency band. Now this graph should look a little bit more organized. Uh, this graph shows the system effects corresponding to variations in ceiling layers. The curves corresponding to all six of the ceiling layer configurations represented with the, within the modeling database are shown here. Of course, variations in gypsum wallboard weight thickness and number of layers can bring about differences in assembly TL contours. However, most of these differences are accounted for by differences in the layer transmission loss values of the ceiling layer alone. Thus, the system effects associated with variations in the ceiling layer are relatively consistent with one another. As you can see, they kind of all stick together and follow the same path for the most part. And here's a graph showing the same thing for uh, the different system effects associated with uh, various floor layers. Just as for the graph on the previous slide, this graph shows the relative consistency of system effects across uh, different layer configurations. For most of, the vari most of the variation in assembly transmission losses associated with differences in floor layers are accounted for by uh, the layer TL values of the floor layer alone. Okay, Suzanne, can you test them uh, or uh, read this quiz I would, question? I would be happy to. Thank you. Data from over 100 tested assemblies was used to develop and validate the TR15 model. Is that true or false? Okay, you've got about two more seconds to answer, and I will close it. Okay, the results are 93% say true. So what do you say, Jason? Okay, great. Yep, that is correct. Um, in fact, it was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was uh, 117 assemblies were represented within the combination of the modeling database and the validation database, although some of those, of course, were partial assemblies. So, but yes, the answer is true. 
So now that you understand how the data was parsed and analyzed, we can move on to the exciting part of where I get to explain how the model works. Just to give an overview of how the AWC model works for estimating STC, we start by estimating the transmission losses through the assembly. The transmission loss values through the assembly are estimated as the sum of the, of the transmission loss values from each layer, the layer TL values, plus the system effect of the assembly. The system effect of the assembly under evaluation can be approximated using the portion of the equation contained within brackets on this slide. It is taken as the system effect of the corresponding baseline assembly plus a sum of adjustments that's necessary to account for component variations from that baseline assembly. Estimated values for specific terms within this equation are given in tabular form within TR15, Technical Report 15. For example, here's an excerpt from Table 1.3.2a of TR15, which provides tabulated layer TL values for the floor layer. This is only a portion of the table, uh, not, not the entire table. However, you can see that the independent variable consists of a combination of framing type and spacing and subfloor type, thickness, and number of layers. And of course, estimated TL values are given for each of the one-third octave frequency bands from 100 hertz all the way up to 4,000 hertz. <clears throat> this gives an excerpt of the TR15 table, which gives a TL or it gives TL values for the ceiling layer. The previous one was for the floor layer. This is for the ceiling layer. Notice that there's one extra column in this table, which uh, when compared to the one uh, that I just showed for the uh, floor layer, and that's because this also has another variable, which is um, the resilient channel spacing. The TR15 model uses a total of eight baseline assemblies. These simply re represent assembly configurations which are used as foundations within the TR15 model. Six of the baseline assemblies are untopped, meaning that they don't have a cast-in-place topping, and the other two are for assemblies having a one-inch thick gypsum concrete topping. This table summarizes the components making up each of these baseline assemblies. System effects for these baseline assemblies were either directly derived from empirical test data or estimated using empirical data from other similar assemblies. The values for these system effects are provided within tables 1.3.4a through 134d of TR15. I'll show you an excerpt of one of these uh, one of these tables in the next slide. There's nothing really magical. First, let me just note: there's nothing really magical about these baseline assemblies. Uh, they were simply logical configuration choices given the available data that we had and also common construction practices. Here's an excerpt from table uh, from TR15 table 134A, which numerically tabulates the system effects of some of the baseline assemblies. You can see the baseline assemblies listed in the top three rows of this table. All of the other rows from the fourth row down contain adjustment values to account for variations from the baseline assembly. Tables 134A through, or I'm sorry, 134B through 134D give, also give system effects and adjustment values, but they apply to other joist spacings and uh, also for assemblies with cast in place toppings. Like I said, this is just an excerpt. It comes from the top part of table 134A. The remainder of the table provides adjustment values for other component variations, including variations in insulation, subfloor, and resilient channel spacing. The TL modeling equation is used to estimate, the one that I've already presented, which is also shown here in this box, is used to estimate the transmission loss through the assembly for each one-third octave frequency band from 100 hertz up to 4,000 hertz. Then the ASTM E413 reference contour is fitted to the estimate to this estimated TL contour to the highest possible level where these two conditions are satisfied, the two that are listed here. Number one being the sum of deficiencies across all frequencies cannot exceed 32 decibels. And the second one being no single point deficiency exceeds eight decibels at any, any one third octave frequency. 
for the purpose of contour fitting, the term deficiency here refers to the difference between the transmission loss through the assembly and that of the reference contour. However, it's only counted at, at one-third octave frequency bands where the reference contour is higher than the transmission loss through the assembly. To demonstrate this graphically, the ASTM E413 reference contour is shown here in red. Then another contour, which is shown in gray, represents an example in which the reference contour is shifted upwards by 50 points. For clarity on this graph, I didn't show the, um, the TL, the transmission loss contour, but uh, this example would correspond to a sound transmission class of 50 because it's been, because the reference contour has been shifted upwards by 50 points. So now you know how the AWC model works for predicting STC, let's take a look at how it works for predicting IIC. In the IIC model, impact sound pressure levels are estimated at each frequency in a manner similar to the STC model. As you can see from this equation, the IIC model is based in part on the TLA values, the transmission loss through assembly values uh, that are derived from the STC model, the STC portion of the AWC model. But then these values are modified by adjustments denoted here as delta ISPL. This adjustment accounts for the effects of the floor covering, and it also accounts for other differences in the acoustical response of the assembly resulting from direct impact excitation, specifically from the impact machine that's used in the ASTM E492 test. Note also that the TLA values are actually subtracted from a constant value of 110 at each frequency in this equation. So generally speaking, the higher the TL of the assembly at a given frequency, the lower the ISPL will be. This is because ISPL represents the sound pressure level, uh, sound pressure level that is, and uh, whereas the TL represents a pressure loss. So level versus loss, and that's why they, uh, they appear very different on on, uh, in graphical form. Here's an excerpt from the TR15 table providing ISPL adjustment values. The independent variables in this table include, number one, whether or not there is a cast-in-place topping, number two, the number of gypsum wallboard layers in the assembly, and thirdly, the general type of floor covering. For assemblies having a topping, a, uh, a fourth consideration which affects the ISPL adjustments is the presence or absence of insulation within the joist cavities. The five general types of floor coverings represented within this table and within the TR15 model are described in detail within TR15. Um, however, the model is not necessarily limited to just these five floor coverings. It's just that these are the five for which um, delta ISPL values are given within TR15. Other delta ISPL values could be derived for other floor coverings and used, and the model can be used for that. And these, these floor coverings were selected as some of the more common floor coverings used in light frame construction, and they were tested as part of the modeling and validation databases. Just like in the STC model, the ISPL is estimated for the assembly at each one-third octave frequency, one-third octave band frequency, and the ASTM E989 reference contour is fitted to the estimated ISPL contour such that the same conditions are met. Specifically, number one, that the sum of deficiencies is, doesn't exceed 32 decibels, and then you don't have any single point deficiency exceeding eight decibels at any given frequency. Note, however, that the term deficiency is applied differently for determining IIC than it is for STC. In this case, the deficiency is the difference between the ISPL and the reference contour counted only where the reference contour is lower than the ISPL. I'll go through that in, uh, in a little more detail if we have a time to do an example at the end of this presentation. This graph demonstrates how the ASTM E989 reference contour is fitted to the ISPL contour to demonstrate the uh, impact insulation class, or IIC. In this example, the reference contour, again represented by a red line, is shifted upward 60 points. According to ASTM E989, the IIC is taken as 110 minus the number of points that the reference contour is shifted. So the shifted reference contour in this example would correspond to an IIC of 50. 
This same procedure, again, is used in the TR15 model to determine IIC. Suzanne, you want to ask them a question here? I would be happy to. Which of the following is not used within the TR15 STC model? A, individual transmission losses of the ceiling and floor layers. B, the noise reduction coefficient of the assembly. C, the system effect of the baseline assembly. Or D, adjustments to account for variations from the baseline assembly. Okay, we're at 60%. Maybe a few more people can answer, try answering the question. There are no penalties. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. And we have a little bit of a split response here. The uh, B was the most popular answer, closely followed by D and A right behind that. So, Jason, okay. I'll let you explain that. Okay, good. Well, the most popular vote got it. Um, it is it is B, uh, the one that the one of these that is not used within the TR15 model is noise reduction coefficient. Um, the rest of these A, C, and D, they are used, and uh, in fact, they're summed in accordance with the equation that I showed a little earlier. The individual transmission losses of the ceiling and floor layers are added up, and then also the system effect of the baseline assembly, and then any adjustments that are necessary to account for variations that, that uh, there may be from that baseline assembly are also added in. So the, the one that's not used is the noise reduction coefficient. All right, so I won't take too long to go through this next section, but obviously a very important question with any model is, has it been validated and how accurate is it? A total of 62 complete assemblies were used in the modeling database. 48 of these were bare floor, meaning they did not have floor coverings, and the other 14 were assemblies with various representative floor coverings. But in addition to these, these data points, TL and ISPL data from an additional 39 assemblies were used to validate the model. The data from these 39 additional assemblies included a diverse array of component combinations not represented within the modeling database. Thus, test data from a total of 101 complete assemblies were used in this project. And of course, that doesn't include the partial assembly tests, which I talked about earlier. The, those partial assembly tests were used to derive the layer TL values in the model. This scatter plot gives a graphical representation of how well the model estimated values compared to the test derived values for all of these assemblies. Model estimated values are on the vertical axis while test derived values are on the horizontal axis. The diagonal line is a one-to-one -one ratio, so points that fall directly on the line represent cases where the model estimated value was exactly the same as the measured value. The red triangles indicate IIC validation points for assemblies having floor coverings, and then the circular, the circular points of varying colors indicate STC validation points and STC points from assemblies within the modeling database. As you can see from this graph, the model estimated STC and IIC values are generally pretty close to the actual measured values. Here's a histogram which provides a different graphical representation of how well the model fits the available test data. About 60% of the model estimated STC and IIC values were identical to the measured values. This is evident as the tall bar in the center corresponding to the zero mark on the horizontal axis. You can see that for the model estimations which were not identical to the measured values, the majority had negative error values. This indicates a slight tendency to underestimate rather than overestimate where errors do exist. This slightly conservative skew is apparent in the bar graph here. And this is especially true with the with the validation uh, data that's shown as green and red portions of the bars here on this histogram. That represents the bulk of the validation data. 
I'll just summarize the validation portion of this presentation before we close, uh, close the presentation out with a few examples. Um, as illustrated in the histogram on the previous slide, all of the model estimated values were within plus or minus three STC or IIC points of the measured values. In fact, about 83% of these were estimated, of these estimated values were within plus or minus one STC or IIC point. The model has a slight tendency to underestimate for assemblies having multiple component variations from the baseline assembly. Generally, this lends a slight degree of conservatism to the model. Overall, the model is reasonably accurate for estimation of STC and IIC on assemblies within the model within the scope of the model. And of course, the scope of the model applies to, as I mentioned before, to light frame floor ceiling assemblies having component combinations addressed within TR15. In this last section, let's take a look at how the TR15 model can be applied to calculate the STC and IIC for some example floor ceiling assemblies. Consider, for example, a floor ceiling assembly with the following components. A floor covering consisting of thin carpet over a typical underpad, a subfloor consisting of one layer of 1932 inch OSB, six inch thick fiberglass insulation bat between the joists, two by 10 joists at 16 inches on center, RC1 resilient channels face at 24 inches on center and running perpendicular to the joists, and then one layer of 5 8 inch gypsum wallboard. Using the equation we previously discussed for estimating the assembly transmission loss values, an estimated TL contour can be derived. This is shown numerically on the sixth row of this table. It's the row that's titled estimated TL. The ASTM E413 reference contour is then fitted to this estimated TL contour to derive an estimated STC of 52. By the way, the deficiencies and the sum of deficiencies are shown on the bottom row of this table. You can see them there. Hopefully you can read them. The STC for this assembly is governed both by the sum of deficiencies, which is 32 in this case, and the single point eight decibel deficiency at 160 Hertz. Here's the estimated TL contour along with the shifted reference contour fitted to it. The deficiencies are indicated as gray bars along the bottom of the graph. And then this graph shows a comparison of the measured TL, which is the red curve, to the estimated TL, which is the dark blue curve. The curves are very close to each other at the mid to low range frequencies, but are significantly different at higher frequencies. This deviation at higher frequencies is due to the fact that the TR15 model neglects the influence of the floor covering for prediction of STC. Thankfully though, the governing frequencies for light frame assemblies such as this are generally on the low end of the spectrum. So as we'll see in a minute, this does not usually result in a significant error to the STC predictions. And where it does result in error, the error is generally slightly conservative. ISPL values are also calculated using the TR15 model, as shown in this table, and the ASTM E989 reference contour is fitted to the estimated ISPL contour. This, this results in an estimated IIC of 66 for this assembly. The IIC for this example is controlled by the 8, de eight decibel single point deficiency at 100, and her 100 hertz, excuse me, which is far, far at the uh, low end of the spectrum. You can see the number that's uh, number eight there that's bolded at the uh, lower left corner there. From this graph, you can clearly see how the eight decibel single point deficiency at 100 Hertz governs the IIC. The estimated ISPL contour is shown as the dark blue curve and the shifted reference contour is the red line. So recall that in this example, the estimated STC is 52 and the estimated IIC is 66. For this particular assembly, we actually have test data so we can compare the estimated values to the measured values. The measured STC is 53 and the measured IIC is 67. Thus for both STC and IIC, the estimated values were just one point lower than the measured values. 
so I think we have a little bit of time, enough time to go through another example here. We'll go through example two. Consider as this second example, a floor ceiling assembly with the following components. This one is quite a bit different here. Uh, it has a floor covering consisting of a floating wood laminate floor covering. So the floor covering is different. It's over a thin closed cell foam underlay, which is typical, typically used under those um, wood laminate floor coverings. A nominal one inch thick cast in place gypsum concrete topping. A subfloor consisting of one layer of 23 30 seconds inch OSB. Again, six inch thick fiberglass insulation between the bats, but then the framing is different. It has nine and a half inch deep prefabricated wood eye joist framing at 24 inches on center. And then RC1 channels that are spaced at 16 inches on center running perpendicular to the joist. And then finally for the ceiling layer, it has two layers of five eighths inch gypsum wallboard rather than one. Just as we did in the first example, the TR15 model is used to estimate the assembly transmission loss values. And again, this, this is shown numerically here for this example in the row titled estimated TL. The ASTM E413 reference contour is then fitted to this estimated TL contour to derive an estimated STC of 67. This is governed by the sum of deficiencies, which is 32 decibels or 32 yeah, decibels uh, summed up in this case. The deficiencies which are given in the in the bottom row are primarily, they primarily occur at the low to mid-range frequencies. You can see that here. Here's the graphical comparison of the measured TL, which is the red curve, to the estimated TL, which is the dark blue curve. The curves closely track each other at the low to mid-range frequencies. In fact, they're even closer in this example than they were in the first example, but they still diverge at the higher frequencies. Since the TR15 model neglects the influence of the wood laminate floor covering for prediction of STC, this deviation at higher frequencies is expected. As you can see, the higher frequencies are where the floor coverings usually have the greatest effect. But again, since the lower frequencies are the ones that typically govern for light frame assemblies, this doesn't result in significant error for the STC. In fact, for this example, it doesn't result in any error at all. I'll get to that in a second. But then we can, let's, let's calculate first the ISPL values and the resulting IIC, estimated IIC. Uh, there, again, the ISPL values are estimated using the TR15 model and the ASTM E989 reference contour is fitted to it, fitted to this ISPL contour. For example two here, we get an estimated IIC of 56 and it's controlled by the eight decibel single point deficiency. This time it's at 200 Hertz. So for example two, the estimated STC is 67 and the estimated IIC is 56. Just as in example one, we have actual test data for this assembly so we can compare it, the estimated values to the measured values. And uh, the measured, uh, both the measured and IIC, or measured and um, STC and IIC are identical to the estimated ones. It's uh, STC of 67 and IIC of 56. So therefore, in this example, the model estimated values are exactly the same as the measured ones for both STC and IIC. Okay, I think we have one more question here, Suzanne, if you want to ask yes. that. The last poll question is, the TR15 model is used for estimation of blank for light frame floor ceiling assemblies. A, STC and IIC ratings, B, sound absorption, C, reverberation times, or D, all of the above. Couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close it. And, well, you got 61% A and 35% D. Okay, well, yeah, the majority of them got it right then. It's, uh, it is A, uh, the TR15 model is used for estimating STC and IIC ratings. 
Um, although uh, the other two, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't use it for estimating sound absorption or reverberation times. Um, however, sound absorption is, um, you know, that's part of what um, what affects the uh, predicted, the estimated STC and IIC ratings, and that's that's uh, reflected within the system effects that are that were derived for uh, specifically for um, uh, sound absorption the material within the cavities within the uh, the framing cavities of or the joist cavities there in the assembly specifically I'm referring to insulation of course so the answer is uh, is a that it, uh, you predict STC and IIC ratings with the TR15 model And uh, so this concludes our presentation on the TR15 model for calculating code-regulated sound transmission parameters. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope it's been informative. If you would, please be sure to visit our website at awc.org, where you can download TR15 free of charge if you're interested. I think we, uh, we may have some time for a brief Q&A now. So one question we have is, where can I find the TR15? Okay, sure, yeah. Um, it is available uh, on the AWC website, as I mentioned. Uh, let me let me see if I can just um, go here. I do have, uh, since it's saved as my home page, I got the AWC website here. This is our main page. And then if you go to, can you see my cursor right now? I can see it, yeah. Okay. Uh, click on publications there. And then... Um, and then if you'll scroll down a little bit, you can see under technical report series, TR series, TR15 is available right here. So you can click on that and uh, and you can download it here from where it says free download. Wow, so, free. Yep. That's awesome. And then if we were to have a calculator available, when that will be, where would we go for that? That would be under the uh, the same under the calculators uh, portion on our website, and uh, it'll be along with all the others that we have. Um, let's see here. I put you on the spot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's see. I think go to Why home, it, right? Go to home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go home, Jason. So. <laughs> yeah and then yeah here it is right here yeah so very easy to find it would be right in this location great it's not uh that that would probably that'll be available probably uh around the beginning of uh, 2019 is right. what i'm estimating now great. the uh tier 15 since it's you know it it's very new it was just posted just recently so uh that's uh, brand new, and feel free to peruse that in the meantime. Great. Yes, a very helpful tool or resource. So another question. Uh, a lot of our audience are engineers. Could you um, mention something about how this applies to what structural engineers normally do in their design? And, and Yes. Their yeah, absolutely. Um, Whenever you're, you know, for anyone who's trying to uh, show compliance for light frame, uh, for wood frame uh, floor ceiling assemblies, compliance with the uh, the STC and IIC requirements of Section 1206 of the of the IBC, um, this could be a very handy tool. Uh, you know, you can you can either show um, test data, of course, in accordance with ASTM E90 or E492 for the exact assembly that you're, that you're um, using, uh, or you can uh, use this tool now for, um, for estimating the STC and IIC, which is, since this is an empirical model, it, it meets the, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it uses the ASTM E90 and E492 data for mm -hmm. other similar assemblies, and uh, so, you know, and obviously it's been validated, so it can be used to uh, show compliance with the code provisions for estimating those STC and IIC values. This is great. So all the engineers in the audience can share with your clients, the architects that um, deal with this a lot. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And then you can you explain or elaborate a little bit on fire resistance rating and sound transmission. 
with assemblies and um, the need for certain ratings in each. Sure, how... yes. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah, um, and uh, as you probably know, uh, there are certain uh, certain aspects where uh, sound transmission ratings and fire resistance ratings kind of uh, you make certain changes to a to to a floor ceiling assembly and it may benefit one and actually um, decrease performance in the other for example um, uh, resilient channel spacing is one of those where you have a uh, a inverse effect for uh, for sound transmission performance versus fire resistance rating. If, uh, you know, for fire resistance ratings, you get a better performance uh, with the closer spacing of resilient channels. And um, uh, for sound transmission, you actually get better. You can get better, not always, but you can get better uh, for the, um, the wider spacing of resilient channels. So uh, that's, not, that's not hard and fast, that's not a hard and fast rule, but there are uh, nuances to that and those are reflected within the model. But, but then of course there are other, uh, other cases wherein they both work together and uh, like for example, insulation within the, uh, within the cavity, you can get benefits from, for both fire resistance rating and for, um, for sound performance from insulation. So, but the point is that um, now there's, there are already tools out there for, um, for evaluating fire resistance performance in addition to just a straight ASTM E119 test. Um, but this provides another tool for also estimating for that same assembly, the uh, sound transmission performance of that assembly. Great, thank you. Um, someone was asking about um, the insulation in the cavity. Where exactly is that in the cavity when they put insulation? Okay, yeah, it would be um, between the joists. Uh, so, yeah, um, this refers to insulation that that is placed between the joists, and I think I mentioned that on the examples that I uh, that I talked about. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. um, either either fiberglass bat or um, or mineral wool bat. Uh, those are the two main. Let me go to uh, the system effects here. Just show you this slide also. Yeah. Um, this shows the uh, the system effects of varying insulation types um, and thicknesses within the joist cavity. But to answer your question, uh, I'm probably droning on here, but the short <laughs> answer to your question is it's uh, between the joists. Right. Yep. And um, is there something of note? perhaps between fiberglass and mineral wool in this slide regarding thickness yep. and all of that. Yeah, as you can see in this, yeah, since I have this slide up, I guess you notice that, that, um, that uh, for a given thickness and density, uh, it, does, it does appear that uh, there's a slight benefit for mineral wool over fiberglass, but uh, you know, that, that can be compensated for by uh, using other thicknesses. For example, if you're using um, eight inch fiberglass versus three and a half inch mineral wool, um, the eight inch fiberglass is generally going to outperform the three and a half inch mineral wool bat. Uh, but, uh, and, and also, as you can see at different frequencies, uh, they have different performances, you know. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the the frequencies where the insulation tends to have, and I'm referring to all insulation now, all sound absorption material, the frequencies where it has the biggest effect, as you can see, is the mid-range frequencies around, um, you know, uh, three two hundred fifty to um, you know to about a thousand hertz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the, so this one shows where there's no insulation and going to the next slide, which is showing variations. Uh-huh. Yep. In ceiling layers, this one here. Right. This one did not show a, a line for no in, um, layering. Yes. Yeah, because, um, 
that would be considered a partial assembly then if it didn't have a ceiling layer. So yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, notice that whenever I talk about the assemblies here, I'm, I refer to floor ceiling assemblies. That's because this model is uh, for predicting, it's used for predicting uh, STC and IIC values for floor ceiling assemblies, mm -hmm. not for just floor assemblies without, without a ceiling membrane. Um, right. And you generally wouldn't need to demonstrate um, um, IIC or STC number for just a floor assembly, you know, because if it if it doesn't have a finished ceiling below it, it chances are it's not separating two um, two dwellings, you know. Occupiable. Or, yeah, exactly. So yeah. so you wouldn't need to demonstrate an STC or IIC value usually for those. Okay, someone um, had asked. Given this TR15 and this method of calculating uh, sound ratings, um, can you provide some insight on how building departments will receive this information? Or, I mean, you did point out in the code, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Where it's specified in the code. Yeah, let me go back to, uh, I can show the slides that have the, you know, excerpts of those. Um, so yeah, uh, specifically looking at um, this, uh, you know, the alternative uh, that allows for um, the sound transmission class and also the other section which allows for the input impact insulation class to be derived, uh, established through engineering analysis that's based on a comparison of walls and uh, partitions and floor ceiling assemblies having sound transmission class ratings that are determined in accordance with ASTM E90 and and likewise for structure borne sound transmission E492. So this um, this model since it's purely empirical you know falls directly within that um, uh, uh, you know it should be uh, justifiable I would imagine you know. By submitting that yeah. TR15 Yes, exactly. Yeah, TR15 and the uh, and the you know if if necessary the uh, the data that uh, was used even if they want to get into that level of uh, of analysis you know mm -hmm. yeah the data that was used to derive those values in TR15 also. And does the TR15 provide some commentary on how it's was developed? I would assume it does. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a big portion of the. Uh, that's pretty much all of uh, the first part of TR15. Okay. Yeah. Great. And I believe. Do we have any other questions coming in? There was one related to slide 28, 29. I think okay. it was. Is that the one we just went over? Yeah, that's see. the one. Or 2627, I believe it was. Okay, well, that's 28. Okay, wait a second. There we go. 26 and 27. Could you explain that okay. again related sure. to those? And I, I think you there's mean, another slide related to the differences between the curves. Oh, oh, okay. All right, so not this, but um, yeah, must are you be referring different. to this right here? Right, but then there's another one that shows the differences. Um, I think yeah. it's in the further well, Let me go down. to the, it's in the examples, yeah. Yeah, let me yeah. scroll down to that. And um, yeah, because this one, that one, this yeah. shows how, how uh, this is, was, remember it was for example one, um, shows the estimated TL contour, transmission loss contour, that's this dark line that looks like a um, looks like you know either black or uh, or dark blue, but um, that's this line here. And then it also shows the shifted reference contour in red here, which was fitted to it such that you satisfy both of those conditions that I mentioned earlier. You can't have you can't have a sum of uh, deficiencies exceeding 32, and you also can't have a single point deficiency exceeding eight decibels. In this case, uh, as I mentioned, for example, one, it actually, both of those conditions are triggered. And so both of them govern for uh, determining the shifted uh, reference contour and hence the uh, STC here. But notice also that uh, these gray bars here, they, 
they represent the deficiencies. Notice that you only see the gray bars where the red line is higher than the um, than the estimated TL contour, transmission mm -hmm. loss contour. So that's because, as I as I mentioned when I was describing this, um, there the deficiencies only count in those areas where, uh, for those frequencies, I should say, where the um, shifted re reference contour is higher than the estimated TL. And then, and then also uh, conversely for the, you know, for the ISPL contour, um, the deficiencies only count where the opposite is true, where the, um, the shifted reference contour is lower than the estimated ISPL.